with you all live. Good afternoon, good afternoon everybody and welcome to the Sunset Safari on this the very last day of May 2016 of the Common Era. My name is James Hendry, for those of you who don't know and for those of you who do, I'm sorry I have returned from leave. You thought you were rid of me, but alas you were incorrect, here I am. On camera today also returned from leave, Brian, the thumb, six foot four, Joubert. Returned from Johannesburg this very morning, we're fresh as daisies. We're wilting winter daisies, of course, and ready to take you on a sunset safari here in the middle of the iconic Kruger National Park. And you would have seen from the first shot there, things have become quite dry. Now, for the regular viewers, of course, you'll have been watching this and watching the grass go slowly from the sort of, it was quite a nice autumnal green when I left, and go to this kind of much more golden yellow color that it is now. That, of course, will continue as we go into the dry season. It's only just about June, and so we've got another three or four months of dryness to come, and so I think things are going to look pretty rough by the time we get our first rains with any luck in November. I'm going to try not to talk too much about that because by the time those rains do come about, I will be hoarse from mentioning it. Now, you are on a live safari. If you're wondering who this fellow is blethering to you into the screen, you are on a very live safari in the middle of the Kruger National Park and we would like to talk to you. I don't wish to talk to you all afternoon. I wish you to talk to me as well. Hashtag safari live if you can tweet. If you're unable to tweet and are emailing, well, then send us an email at questions at wildearth.tv. Otherwise, just sit along and enjoy the ride. We're going to go and see what we can find. Not much found on Juma this morning. Uh, there are some beautiful buffalo bulls just sort of lying in the sun here. And they've changed their sort of modus operandi because they would normally in the heat of the day be lying in the water. Well, water, of course, not much water, mostly their own detritus. But that's where they'd be cooling down. And now, because of we're into the winter, they're lying out in the sun, enjoying the warm winter rays that we have here. And winter, of course, in this part of the world, an entirely relative term. For most of you, of course, winter is not a place you want to be outside during the middle of the day. But here, it's a balmy 24 degrees Celsius, which I think, if I'm not mistaken, must put us at around 75 degrees Fahrenheit. 76 degrees Fahrenheit. In the final control today, shouting at me when I get things like the Fahrenheit temperature wrong, Kirsten McKinnon-Smith, she's being ably assisted by Geraldine the Cheesecake Kent, of course, and I was very disappointed to find that Geraldine had not made a cheesecake uh, for the return of Brian and I. Brian, you were quite upset about that, uh, yeah, weren't you? I, yeah. His face is a picture. Anyway, what we're going to do is go from waterhole to waterhole for most of the afternoon, see what we can find there, and uh, then we'll just figure things out as we go along. Here we go, Brian. Are you ready? I'm very ready. Good. Well, Wendy seems semi-ready. Wendy is this recalcitrant old bag that I'm driving, and um, she uh, she's still going, amazingly. I didn't think she'd last the next two weeks, but here she is, and off we go. Our first stop will be at Twin, not Twin Dams, at uh, Treehouse Dam. Hello, Aaron in New Zealand. Thank you very much uh, for your welcome back. Uh, not so many thanks for piling on the pressure at this early stage of our work cycle. Uh, you say that we're going to have to try and top. Oh, hello. Did you miss me? Yes, I'm sure you did. I cannot blame you. It's a buffalo bull, everybody. He's sitting very close to us, only about mm, four meters or so, 12 feet. He's very relaxed. He was very relaxed. He's decided that Brian and I are sufficiently unfamiliar for him to move off. Well, Aaron, uh, not quite the pangolin. You were suggesting we try and top that uh, Brent, managed to, Brent and Dave managed to find on Cheetah Plains. What a wonderful sighting that was. Uh, but we did find you a buffalo, Aaron. Um, well, I think we'll call that quits, eh, Brian? Mm. I mean, we haven't seen a buffalo for a while. Mm, two no, weeks is a splendid, two, sighting. A splendid sighting. And a red-billed oxpecker. That the, is the bird, everybody, crawling about on his head. And we often get asked about those white stripes underneath the eyes. 
of those white stripes from that very bird pecking away at the ticks and probably trying to get a bit of the, at the flesh, the soft flesh under the eye. Righty. That was a wonderful first sighting, wasn't it, Brian? On we go. Come on, old Wendy. Here we go. Uh, during the course of the afternoon, remember, we are now gearing up for two TV specials that we're going to be doing with Nat Geo Wild in about two weeks' time. And we're going to be doing things like practicing advert breaks, which, of course, are going to be completely nonsensical. There won't be any adverts. There will be no break in transmission. I might just say, now we're going to go to an advert break. And then I will carry on the normal safari. And that's just so that we can practice what's going on. So we don't want, of course, when we are broadcasting to the television to make dreadful mistakes. No one wants that, do they, Brian? Not at all. So Treehouse Dam we are going to now via Ingwe Alley. Well, now this is another interesting sighting. Brian, look at that. I haven't seen that before, have you? Nope seems to be an enormous piece of concrete that has made its way onto the side of the road here. Hmm. Some tectonic activity while we were away, Brian. It's an impressive rock slash piece of concrete. Not sure where that came from. Uh, oh, you may have wondered why I haven't announced who is on the other vehicle. Uh, the other vehicle is not going to be out this afternoon, I'm afraid. Uh, Stefan, the mystic winter farmer, is going to be on walk this afternoon. And that is because we're doing some running repairs on, on Jigger and Rusty. And so it will be me and Steph this afternoon. It will be... Yes, that is the correct, correct English. And I speak of that. I speak of that, where they say speak of the devil. Stefan, of course, a rather mystic angel, rather than devil. Let's and find out what he's going to do this afternoon. Oh, welcome to one of the very first sunset bushwalks that we've been doing in a long, long... That rather large hiatus. Uh, we're just pulling into Buffelshook Dam here, where appropriately there are a lot of Buffels. And we just wanted to get you eye level with them so you can see them from this sort of angle. Brian, is that horrible? Shall I try and... is it okay? So it's quite a large herd of buffalo that are coming down to Buffelshook Dam, which is marvellous. Most pleased to have them. I must just apologize again. Not sure what happened for this, to the stream. Uh, it died. Uh, it has been resurrected by the brilliance of Peter Bratt all the way from Cape Town. Uh, he is the only productive human being in Cape Town, of course. And so, therefore, we don't mind that he lives there. But this herd is getting bigger and bigger. And I, I you know, around here, I haven't, I've yet to see particularly large herds of buffalo. And so it's quite nice to see a herd this size. There are probably about 200 of them coming through here, I would reckon. Did you say, Brian? No. Give or take. Give or take. Very nice. The vast expanse, Brian, of beefaloes. Of course, Brian and I wouldn't have seen many beefaloes on our leave, would we, Brian? They don't occur greatly in Johannesburg, nor do they occur greatly in the Eastern Cape, where I was. But I did see some, quite interestingly, some elephants in the Eastern Cape. And they were sitting on a river that I was very privileged to travel up. And it's a salt river, so they don't drink from it, but they do like to frolic and swim in it during the hot days. And I've yet to see a decent elephant swimming here. And I'm, every time I come to Buffelshook and find elephants, I hope that they're going to sort of take a merry swim, but I've yet to see it happen. There's also a hippopotamus here. The buffalo are not alone. There he is. 
and he was standing up out of the water when we arrived, looking most upset that 200 buffalo had descended on his place of refuge. And he's watching them with sort of ill intent. So if you have just wandered across to this stream and wondering what on earth this is that you're watching, you're on a live safari. Uh, we're back again after about a 45 minute sort of delay due to various technical glitches and please do talk to us if you'd like to ask us questions about where we are in the world how we came to be where we are and we'll be more than happy to tell well tell you a bit about what we do or answer any questions that you might have about the animals you're seeing you can do that through twitter hashtag safari live or questions at wildearth.tv if you're on the email And behind us you can hear the wonderful call of the grey go-away bird going which of course translates in bird speak to go away it's part of a very colorful group of birds called the turacos this one being the least colorful bird we get anywhere plain grey it is Hello Dustin in Arkansas, you want to know what the birds are that hang around on the backs of the buffalo? Well, Dustin, it's not only the buffalo, they hang around on the backs of the Nyala and the Impala and... What was that? Justin, not Dustin. Sorry, Justin. Uh, Unyala, Impala, uh, Rhino even, uh, just about all the antelope except the very small ones these oxpeckers will hang around on. And they do that because they like to eat ticks. Well, they don't like so much like to eat ticks, but they do like to drink the blood that the ticks have pulled out of the buffalo. And so what they'll do is they'll sit around on animals like this. And of course, there are plenty of ticks and other ectoparasites that cover the bodies of animals like this. And when there's a wound opened up, the oxpeckers will peck at the wound and sort of take out bits and pieces of flesh. And it's largely the blood that they're after. And so we get two kinds here, most commonly the red-billed oxpecker, and then we also get the yellow-billed oxpecker, but that's less common. In this area, I'd say probably 80% the red-billed and 20% the yellow-billed. This is, the herd just keeps coming. There might be more than 200 Debbie, very nice question from you, and when I first heard this kind of uh, fact, if you like, I thought precisely the same as you, that you thought it was counterproductive and counterintuitive, certainly. You say that Brent has said that the buffalo herds are banding together as we go into the winter, and you say it seems counterintuitive and counterproductive because there's less forage. Debbie, that's precisely why they are moving together. Remember the water? is going to be much more concentrated so it'll be much more sparse and much more concentrated in specific areas likewise the forage is not nearly as well distributed as it would be in the rainy season uh, they'll have to move further and further away from water towards concentrated areas of forage where there are sort of bits of remaining forage and bits of remaining grazing and because of that they band together, they move together to the concentrated water and then they go off to forage into the, you know, they have to move quite large distances away from the water. In summertime, think of it as there being lots of little pieces of water all over the place, small seasonal pans that the buffalo can go to and then there'll be lots of different areas where the forage is good. And so these big herds that we're watching here now, I mean, they just keep coming. They will split up into much smaller groups during the summer months. So Debbie, I hope that makes sense to you. I know exactly what you mean. I felt precisely the same the first time I heard that buffalo herds were bigger in the winter, but it's unquestionably true. This is fantastic. This really is a magnificent sighting. Now they are doing a few modifications to the dams of this area. Um, they've done treehouse dam, as many of you would have seen. They are busy with twin dams at the moment. 
and they'll be moving on to Biffles Hook Dam shortly. Um, I'm not sure how much water there's going to be left in here once they're finished, but that is in preparation. Apparently, there's quite a few predictions that there are going to be vast floods this year. Predicting the weather, of course, is like trying to predict the behavior of a politician. And so I think it's quite a brave call, but we'll see what happens later this year. You can just maybe see the light starting to, so starting, starting to soften slightly. Brian, just quickly go across. There's a buffalo there. It looks like it's got a... Is that just a leaf in its mouth? Just moving through the mud at the end of the dam there. A leaf. I thought it was a fish for a second. I thought that would have been very strange indeed. But it is a leaf. Not a fish. They don't eat fish much, do they, Brian? Mm, not very often. Not very often, no. No. I shall train my binoculars on it. Yes, not in fact a fish, but a leaf. Good. Would have been very interesting to see a buffalo with a fish, I feel. So what they'll do from here is they will go off and try and find some forage, have a bit of a graze, and then they'll lie down. And in the winter time, unlike during the summer time, what they'll do is they'll sleep at night. They'll huddle together, a little bit like penguins, if you like, in the Antarctic. They'll huddle together and sort of try and stay towards the middle of the herd for the duration of the cold night, and then they'll start to move as dawn breaks and they'll keep moving often for much of the day because, of course, it doesn't get too hot at this time of the year. And Ashley, you say some of them look like they're looking a bit thin. Yeah, they're not looking too bad. I do agree they're one or two individuals that are looking a bit thin. That's purely a function of the forage, I think. I don't think it's a function of disease at all. If you go outside to the community areas at the moment, you'll see that many of the cattle in those areas are very emaciated indeed. So, I mean, they really are having a tough time. The water at the mo or the forage outside in the communities is very poor. And so I think that's all this is. is you know, it's, it's always more delayed with the wild animals because they're much more used to these conditions and the rangelands and these reserves are in much better health than those outside in the community grazing lands. But you'll find that, yeah, there's definitely one or two hips showing, but not nearly as many they're going to be. Hello, Cassie Lion. Cassie Lion, I'm not sure I've heard from you before. I like your name very much, Cassie Lion. You want to know if we get foot and mouth d disease here? Yes, we do get foot and mouth disease here. We also get uh, the people version of it called feet and hands. It's normally feet and hands and mouth disease in human beings. Of course, buffalo don't have hands, do they, Brian? No. no. Uh, but yes, it does occur here every so often. Um, I haven't heard of an outbreak in this area for a long time. And of course, we are on a, we're sort of uh, the eastern side of a veterinary cordon fence beyond which you can't take cattle out and you can't take wild animals like these buffalo out of that cordon and you can't bring them in either. So, you know, unless they've been destroyed or unless they've been to an abattoir and treated. So that kind of, I think, keeps away a lot of the foot and mouth. There have been outbreaks in South Africa, but I haven't heard of one recently amongst wild stock like this. So it is possible, yes, that it could come in here, but at the moment not so much. A friend of mine did get uh, feet and hands and mouth disease the other day. Uh, it seems, seems to go around the nursery schools of this area, and he has a little girl. Unfortunately, she gave him that. He said it's not very nice at all. In fact, he said it was deeply unpleasant, but not in the buffalo so far. <laughs> There's also a really brave grey heron. Just over there, but I there we go. And he's just hoping, I suspect. A bit like a drongo would hope for a buffalo or an elephant to kick up invertebrates, I suspect this heron is hoping for some fish to come running his way that have been disturbed, or even frogs that have been disturbed by the buffalo's hooves churning up the mud. That's quite a nice picture there, isn't it, Brian? Very pretty.
Now, Jacob, you want to know where the term or the name Biffle's Hook comes from. Jacob, I don't know rightly. I mean, it means Buffalo Corner, basically. And so I suspect it must come from the number of buffalo that are around the area. And so I suspect, Jacob, that it's, it was probably just a name that somebody thought up. And we'll just show you on the map where it is now in relation to the rest of the reserve. Kirsten is going to put a map on the screen. So there is the map, and we're zooming into Biffle's Hook now. And so that's where we are. And so that's the northeastern corner of Juma. And it is quite conveniently in the sort of corner, northeastern corner. So maybe that's why it's called. Except that the property to the north of us, of course, the reserve to the north of us is called Biffle's Hook. And I, this dam is the closest place to Biffle's Hook. But a lot of these names, of course, are lost in, pre lost in history somewhere. This vast herd of beefaloes just keeps on coming and coming and coming. And this is lovely. <laughs> Question from someone called Red Red Dog. Um, you want to know if, if buffalo horns continue to grow throughout their lives? Um, red Red Dog, they don't. I, I think the keratin probably keeps being replaced on the edge, but they certainly do reach their apogee probably at about 13 or 14 years. And then that keratin sheath tends to kind of wear off a bit. And so on the really old buffalo, their horns look beaten up and they definitely haven't grown for a number of years. So you'll probably find that they stop growing at around maybe 12 years actually. And then that keratin probably does get replaced, but maybe not that effectively as they get older. And the, the horns, of course, are attached to the skull. They're attached to the skull in the same way, or completely unlike the antlers of, say, a moose or a, um, or a deer. And the bit that you can see is bone covered in keratin. Now apparently the bushwalk is <laughs> immobile at the moment. That is not because Stefan has tripped over a stick and broken an ankle, or indeed because Jandre has uh, managed to injure one of his enormous soccer ball sized calves. Oh no, they have got various technical glitches that they're trying to sort out at the moment. And so that's why we're not going to the bushwalk. You're stuck with me for the next little while, I'm afraid. And we are going to have a school drive at about 4.55 if I'm not mistaken and that will go on till 5.25 Rosedale School in Virginia Beach, Virginia Rosemont, sorry Rosedale, Rosemont, Rose Hill, Rose Tree Bush Mountain The smell now is quite strong doesn't smell, it doesn't smell like buffalo, it smells like, can you smell that? Mm. It smells like water buck, doesn't it? Mm. This is interesting. Now, thank you Ravi for your question in New York. You want to know why is it that prey species tend to thrive more than prey species do? No, I've got no predator species do. Ravi, um, it's by vir virtue of the nature that they get eaten, at least that, um, you know, that it's just how it works. So I'm, I'm not, that's a terrible answer. There is more grass and more vegetation biomass than there are buffalo, for example. And in the same way, every time you move down the trophic pyramid, if you like, every time you move down towards a, an animal that eats more concentrated form of nutrients, so the fewer of them there will be. 
because if they had too many of them, they'd quickly eat themselves out. And you find that that balance is maintained um, simply. Uh, a, a predator's numbers is maintained almost exclusively by the number of prey that they have to eat, in the same way that the number of buffalo will be defined almost exclusively by the amount of grass that there is in a particular area. And it's simply because this area couldn't sustain a great number of lions that they have, obviously within a certain interval. So, I mean, plus or minus, say, 20% of the lions that we have here could probably quite successfully survive. But above that, you start to see an, an immediate crash in the predator numbers, and then the prey numbers would, would drop at the same time. And you'll find that if you look at numbers, I mean, it's not that simple because there are many different factors that affect them but what you'll find is that over time so that I'll, I'll draw a graph for you and we get to uh, um, some sand it's actually I know graphs make most people go cold but um, it's actually quite interesting and you can see quite clearly how when as prey numbers increase so the predators numbers sort of follow them and then as the predator numbers get to a certain point so the predator numbers at least the prey numbers will dive and consequently, so will the prey num the predator numbers. Does that make sense? I think I'm saying predator and prey in quite a, a confused fashion, but I'll draw you a nice picture of it. It's actually quite interesting to see how it works. Righty, I think that this buffalo herd has given us all that it is going to. Uh, it doesn't look like any of them are about to be savaged by a pride of lions. So I think we'll move on, shall we, Brian? Now, I'm going to try and move on without uh, creating some kind of auto accident. There's a very interesting array of clouds developing off to the eastern side, which we'll try and get a view of. Hello, Jesse. What a very nice question from you. And I think we can get some help from Brian here because he flew in. But you want to know what the topography is like on the drive back from Johannesburg. So I normally drive. Brian drives and flies. He doesn't fly himself. Of course he flies a commercial airliner, don't you, Brian? Yes. And the topography, Jesse, is... So if we go from Johannesburg, it's about 600 kilometers, which is in miles, say, about 450 miles from Johannesburg. We are here. So we're on the high felt there, it's very high up, um, sort of about a mile high when you start, and it stays that high up until, in fact, it goes even higher to a place called Belfast, which is the highest town in South Africa, about 2,000 meters above sea level, which is... Oh, it's so difficult doing these conversions if you are not used to it. It's about 1,200 miles... Um, no, it's not. Divide by... I've got, now I've got to go to feet. 2,000 meters is just over about 7,000 feet above sea level is Belfast. So that whole area is uh, farming. They farm sunflowers, they farm a bit of wheat, they farm a bit of maize, and there are also extensive coal mining operations there. And because of that, many of our coal-fired power stations are in that particular area. So up until you hit Belfast area, it's not very attractive at all. It's very flat. Then, you get into the mountains, the sort of foothills of the Drakensberg, the escarpment that comes eventually forms the escarpment that you will see as we go, as the sun starts to go down. Uh, and you go through beautiful areas, the sort of high filled, highland grassland areas, a place called Dulstrom, very famous for its trout farming or trout fishing and just sort of country retreats, if you like, just glorious vistas everywhere you look. Then you go through a place called Leidenberg, which is a completely lamentable settlement, um, but uh, is surrounded by very beautiful hills everywhere. And then after that, you start to descend. You start to get a bit lower, and you get really in amongst these incredible cliffs as you go through Urchstadt. Try and say that, Urchstadt. And Urchstadt is, used to be the seat of the government in, of the old Transvaal Republic. It's now a uh, one-horse town, and I can tell you that there is no good coffee on offer in Urichstadt. Uh, you can only buy chicory there, which is very sad. So between Dahlstrom and Hutzbreit, there is not a good cup of coffee to be had. You must be aware of that, of course, if you're driving. And uh, as you go down from Urichstadt, you get into some community lands. There are some local people living in villages in amongst these absolutely spectacular hills. 
and then you get right into the mountains and you go through what's called the Abel Erasmus Tunnel and that's a tunnel through the Drakensberg and as you get through this tunnel the Lowfeld just explodes out in front of you and you can see hundreds of kilometers off to the east towards Mozambique right over the Kruger National Park and on a very clear day apparently you can see into Mozambique from there so that's what it's like and then you descend down in, down the pass and into the low field and towards the town of Hootspreit and then the topography is very like this it's very much sort of gentle undulating granitic topography and that's the basic route from Johannesburg 450 miles or so Now, my plan from here is to head down towards where we had some elephants while you were on the technical loop. And Cecilia, you want to know about banana trees and whether there are any in this area. Well, there are no wild banana trees, but just to the south and to the west of us, near a town called Hazy View, there are many banana farms uh, where they farm bananas, Brian. Yes, yes very famous for banana farming. There is a bit of citrus farming around this area, around Hootspreit, but otherwise more and more of these farms are becoming wildlife estates and which eventually kind of join up to become very large game reserves. And Brian, not Brian, but Brent lives on a, a reserve called Leadwood and that's 50,000 hectares now. It's almost the same size as the Sabi Sands and that used to, until about 10 years ago was farmland. So more and more of this area is being put back to wildlife, which is just wonderful. But I, I think there's a bit of a front moving in. I do too. Let's just try and get some height so that we might see the spectacular clouds. So we did have some elephants around Treehouse Dam, which now resembles the Kimberley Hole. And Debbie, I was wondering the same thing as you. You say it rained while I was gone or while we were all gone. Kirsten, of course, is also back in the hot seat as of today. And you want to know if I think we might have a wet winter after such a dry summer. And I was wondering the same thing. I don't know that we can predict it. I sort of feel that a little bit in my bones, I must say. Brian does too. And Brian's finger, of course, starts to ache. He's waving it at me now. Uh, there it is. That's <laughs> finger starts to ache when when the pressure drops and the rain comes. So Brian will warn us if any winter rains are going to come. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, very kind of you. We're going to pop out onto the eastern boundary now, and we'll have a look off to the east and see these clouds coming in and see if there's a front. All the while keeping eyes on the road for tracks of interesting animals that we might be able to find. Of course, one does want to see Karula and her cubs after a prolonged absence from the area. So with any luck, we'll see her too. There are some lion tracks here. Oh, this is interesting. There are some lion tracks here. They look relatively fresh. A male and a female. I'll just jump out and show them to you quickly. We might just do a loop around and come back this way. And um, Brian. There we go. That should be alright. Hold on everyone. One must also just check around when one sees lion tracks that the lions aren't in fact right here. Now I don't know if you can see the difference here, but here's the female. And I thought this was a male track, but it isn't. It's actually the other female track. She's just kind of slid slightly. And in soft sand like this, the tracks do get a little bit bigger. So that's her back foot. And here is her front foot. And because it's soft sand, it just kind of splays out a little bit. In the same way that it would if she walked in mud. There's another one there. There are at least two females here. 
they actually go <laughs> they go straight off in there we'll do another loop we'll go around and loop around back towards the dam um, because they may well be following that herd of buffalo although two females taking on a herd of beefalo that size are going to find themselves in trouble they could very easily just be snoozing it up in the shade really not far from here at all anyway let's see what happens we'll pop around the corner I would say they're probably from last night We'll come back to this area. We'll just do a loop around first to see. They could, of course, be uh, they could be five kilometres away. But I know there has been quite a lot of our lion activity around this area and into Torchwood. And of course, we do know that the Nkuhuma Pride lioness gave birth to two little cubs, and there's at least another uh, pregnant female somewhere around the place. So maybe these guys are just moving to and from, maybe having a drink there where they should have water in Torchwood. I don't see any further tracks coming out. So we'll just drive around and see what we can see there. I'm just trying to get up a bit of height because there's some really spectacular cloud formations. I'll drive a little bit faster. And we'll get a little bit higher up and look off to the east. Do tell me if you see a lion, everybody. I'd like to see a lion. I haven't seen a lion for a while especially one with tiny little baby cubs. There we go. That's quite a nice indicator. Check this out, everyone. Isn't that spectacular, Brian? I really think that's quite astonishing. That's the most bizarre sort of winter cloud formation. I mean, it's not as spectacular seeing Karula and her cubs, is it? Almost. It's almost, though. I would agree that it's almost as spectacular. Right, well, we'll press on from here. That really is very pretty indeed. Righty, on we go. Also the call of the red crested Kohan. Hello Opie, a nice question that I'm easily able to answer. Uh, you say what makes male and female lion tracks different and the answer is simply size. So a male's tracks are much bigger, probably about a third the size again. A male track about the size of my hand. Now, I'm not a particularly large human being, but my hand is of average size. I'm not a gypsy. And so about the size of my hand, really. And the female's about a third the size, uh, well, a third smaller. And that's the front, front track. The male, the back track's always slightly smaller, but still bigger than the female's. hearing some kind of radio communications. Oh, there we go. Right. Good news, everybody. Uh, Stefan has gone home. Well, that's not good news, but good news is that Jamie is out and about. She's heading to the hyena den. Let's get an update from her. Good afternoon and welcome to our portion of a somewhat delayed start to our sunset safari. A sunset safari that is curiously beset by gremlins. It seems as though when James and Brian return and Steph returns from the weekend, they just throw everything into considerable turmoil. I am of course joking and it is wonderful to have the team back together once again. Now, I might be here as a temporary vehicle, uh, 
given the fact that our car doctor, Opa, the wonderful, wonderfully gifted mechanic, is going on leave tomorrow, which means that he has to get through both Jiga and Rusty at some point before the sun goes down and the gates close, and he has to delay the start of his leave, which he is understandably most reluctant to do. A Rusty may have to return at any point in time, which means that at present we are limited as to where we can go, and I think, you know, twist my arm a little bit and we might just pay a visit to the hyena den. If they're not home or reluctant to see us, then we shall head through to Sydney's dam and see what's happening there. Exciting times on the Sunset Safari. Rest assured though that the tech team is very much trying to stay on top of the gremlins that keep popping their heads out. In my head what they've got going on at the moment is like a giant game of whack-a-mole. Trying to whack everything that pops up out of nowhere and every time they hit one gremlin another gremlin seems to surface out of nowhere. Possibly in the same place where we had problems just a few days ago. But they are working furiously to try and combat them and I'm sure that they will be on top of things very soon. We do thank you, however, for your patience in sticking with us. It's been a most confusing afternoon for me. I got out ready to go on drive, the drive was then safe result of bushwalk, and then I was back on drive. It's a lovely afternoon though. We shall go and see what we can find in our limited sphere of operations. Now, this morning we had some very interesting hyena action with one of the females from the den site along with apparently one of the, the clan males racing around for no apparent reason sniffing very carefully in an area where something had interesting had happened i couldn't find a thing when i went to investigate it later so i don't know exactly what it was that had them so very interested this morning and there's also a third mystery hyena who i promise you i promise you i saw a hyena it, it went behind a bush when I drew attention to it and it never came out and so we never managed to get it on camera. And I still don't know which particular hyena that might have been. Let's go across to the den and see whether, first of all, Pretty, one of the female that we saw this morning, has returned and whether we've got any of the cubs out for a late afternoon gamble before heading to bed overnight. Oh, and I forgot, as I went to take Rusty out of the garage to get her out on drive, I put my foot flat on the accelerator and nothing happened, which is, well, n something happened, but not what was meant to happen. And that's definitely a very disconcerting feeling. Luckily for us, it was just a spring that had jumped out. And the accelerator still functions perfectly, so if wild dogs come racing past us, we shall be able to keep up with them. And actually, come to think of it, in all of this hubbub, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Jamie, and this afternoon I have Viam on camera with me. Viam, who was initially on bushwalk, helping with some, helping out Steph, doing the camera work, and then for some behind the scenes filming as well. So Viam's also had something of a discombobulated afternoon. I'll have to find him a leopard to make out for it, make up for it. Don't forget to send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or email through to questions at wildearth.tv. Now let us see if we can figure out what's been happening with these hyenas. I'm hoping, I have a little bit of a suspicion that they might have moved to a different den site close to the one here, but not quite the one that we've been visiting the whole time. And of course, with just Brent and myself over the last few days, we haven't had a good opportunity to go out on Bushwalk and actually double check that and to relocate them. So one of the only real ways of locating a hyena den is to do it on foot. Just because you can't go bashing about 
without a direction off road without having somewhere in mind but I would not be at all surprised if they haven't moved just next door to this den site because this is not when not the den site that we very first found all those months ago on Aubrey's Road that they were using back when June and Bella and the February twins were still young enough to be at a den site A very good afternoon to Aaron and Aaron would like to know whether I could continue my jackal streak and find you a jackal. I hope so Aaron. They seem to be around Sandy Patch Road and I'm sort of hoping that if we head across in that direction we might get lucky and we might get have a chance to see them. So we'll keep our fingers crossed and I'll certainly do my best because that's right next to Sydney's Dam which is where we were going to go anyway if the hyena was all quiet which unfortunately it looks as though it might be so don't see the telltale flash of spots oh dear hyenas are invading us what's up rusty nobody's home how dreadfully disappointing. There's still hyena tracks all over Aubrey's Road and that immediately tells me that they're still denning somewhere or they're most likely denning in this area. When you look, it's one of the first things you look for in terms of relocating a hyena den is tracks up and down the road closest to it. That's because hyenas, like other big predators, like to use the roads to navigate around areas. But nobody's home. At least I don't think so. I definitely don't see any cubs scampering about and I don't see any adults sleeping off in the shade either. Okay. Well, we shall just have to go and search elsewhere. And while we navigate our way out of this hyena den, let's head back to James for an update. So we've done a full circle and we're sort of heading back towards Biffleshook Dam now. Uh, I have found no further evidence of lions. So they might be in this block here, but I can't really say that those things were that fresh. So we'll just keep having a fossic about the place and see what we can find, won't we, Brian? Mm -hmm. No telltale flick of a pom-pom bedecked tail. You know, like how I use two different ways of tail there Brian did you you noticed it yes it was entirely by mistake of course no I shouldn't right hmm. that's quite interesting Debbie you say what are my thoughts on junior hooking up with the Inkahumas again um, and for those of you who don't know of course the Inkahuma pride are providing the bulk of our line viewing five lionesses, uh, two little cubs now, and a male lion who is now, I think he's about four and a half, if I'm not mistaken, and he was supposed to have been tossed out of the area by the Birmingham Boys, the dominant male coalition, and the other day he was found feeding, if I'm not mistaken, on a buffalo carcass with the Yunkahuma pride. And Debbie, you want to know what my thoughts on that are? Uh, my thoughts are that it's not entirely uncommon. I think that it's it's unlikely he'll survive around here unless, I mean, he will have to take on the Birminghams. And I don't think he's going to be able to do that on his own. I, know, I do believe that he will be a bigger lion than the Birminghams because his father uh, is definitely larger than those Birmingham fellows. So, but I still don't believe he himself. And that's not a bad thing, of course, because we don't... It 
Sorry about that. Uh, we, don't, we don't really want there to be too much inbreeding amongst the lions. They can cope with a little bit, but if he was to come back into the area, he will unquestionably try and mate with his, well, mother and sister and aunts. And that, of course, uh, well, it's just not great for the genetic diversity of the lion population. Now, look at that. <laughs> We've been away from here for, what, Ryan? Ten minutes. Not a buffalo in sight. All is peace again at Biffles Hook Dam. That's where they were. They've melted off. Now, we did a loop around to the direction that you're looking there, which is to the north, and those buffalo didn't pop out. I'm not sure where they're going to go. But all is peaceful again at Beefles Hook Dam. The grey heron is still there. Now, Bill from New Jersey, you ask a very valid question. Are there any crocodiles in this water here? Bill, I don't know. Um, I would say most likely not. Would I swim across this water? In the absence of that hippopotamus, absolutely no chance at all. Uh, crocodiles move enormous distances, and you just never know where they're going to be. And I've told the story before, but I used to work at a place called Angala, which is not too far north of us here. And there was a dam about half the size of this one, and there were no crocodiles in it. And a guide went along there on a hot summer's day, and he said, well... I think he, I don't know if he had guests or not at the time, but he said, you know, um, well, somebody asked him, Dude, did, were there crocodiles in there? And he said, no, there weren't any crocodiles. He'd never seen a crocodile in the dam before, and it was so hot that he got into the water. He now has one arm. So he was grabbed by a crocodile, unfortunately, took his arm clean off, just a, below the shoulder. Now this, I mean, he's quite a famous guide in Namibia, and he's written a number of books. And unfortunately for him, that's what happened. So, yeah, uh, the, I wouldn't, you wouldn't find me swimming across this water, even if I checked it out and checked it out again for crocodiles. Crocodiles are the stealthiest. And of course, they do see us completely as prey in the same way as they would any other animal. All righty, I think we shall press on from Bifflesook Dam. Fire up the old Wendy. I'm going to do one more loop around to the north, but like in a sort of figure of eight from where we were. You will lose us briefly as we go through the dip here, but then we will return the other side. There is a male leopard track, which I don't think you're going to be able to see with a camera, I'm afraid. It's just the other side there, and I don't think it's distinct enough. No. Sorry, Brian. Um, yeah. We'll keep looking around here. Uh, while we, I think we're going to, are going to lose signal, so let's head across to Jamie. She's at another water hole. All is quiet at Sydney's Dam. No jackal, unfortunately, Aaron. I was keeping my fingers crossed that they might be hiding up in the shade somewhere. They're interesting animals, jackals, because they are largely nocturnal. But if there's something interesting happening, as we saw the other day here at Sydney's Dam, when they were trying to steal bits of carcass from the hyenas, we noticed that they are pretty much active during the day at the same time. I'm going to try and carry on down Sandy Patch on our jackal quest. I have discovered another gremlin but that's a gremlin, we'll, we'll address that later. The keys are stuck and rusty. But we can still turn them in one direction, we just can't fully turn the car off. That's all right, we only need it on for now. We'll cross that particular bridge when we come to it, when we get home this evening. <laughs> oh dear, it never rains, but it pours. Except now in the bush, because it's sort of drought stricken, but gremlin-wise it is pouring. Although those clouds, I hear James was actually commenting on them earlier, those clouds have become a, or are a bit of a surprise. Coming from the east, which is also quite interesting. Hmm, I 
wonder if we're not in for another down, strange, unexpected downfall like the one that we had the other day. Any jackals? They're also, they are territorial, so there is a good chance of seeing them in the same place since their territories are quite small. They are essentially filling a niche that is occupied by foxes in other parts of the world or in American terms very very similar to coyotes and Jesse you are wondering whether or not the jackals are successful in urban environments in the same way that a coyotes are not not very much in the bigger cities I mean jackals are widely distributed throughout South Africa but I have no memory of jackals wandering about at any point in any of the cities, the main cities. Except for Vim, uh, living next to my aunt's house in Pretoria. Oh, there we go. So yes, Jesse, we have an answer from Vim who tells me that there's a pair living next to his aunt's house in Pretoria, just a, a few kilometers north from where I grew up in Johannesburg. That's, that, that doesn't surprise me, and I bet you in places there's a main city in this area called Palaboa. I bet you there are lots and lots of jackal wandering about there because that is where there is a gate to the Kruger and it's not unheard of in Palabora to be filling up your car with gas, petrol um, and to see a jackal wandering, oh not a jackal sorry, a lion wandering along the road or a herd of elephants wandering along the road. Why just the other day an elephant decided that he wanted to try and travel to Hutzpreit which is our home basically it's my home I've been living there for the last four years <laughs> so yes it, it seems most likely none of the I don't remember any around Johannesburg or Durban or Cape Town but certainly it seems as though they are adaptable enough to make their way into cities like that the same is true of leopards believe it or not is a surprising unexpected number it seems of leopards that seem to have taken advantage of the quiet of a city night out here, not out here, in, in the bigger cities. The stories of leopards living in abandoned apartment blocks. There was a, a leopard that lived in the storm park of the Ellis Park Stadium in Johannesburg and basically not known about for a very long period of time. The leopard in the apartment block in Pretoria apparently even raised a litter of cubs successfully. It's surprising what wildlife lurks out there and how they make use of or how they adapt to the presence of people in their homes. There's a famous story of the, the brown hyena that went wandering through, where was it? It was wandering through Randburg, I think, in Johannesburg. And there was a great fuss about it and lots of photos in the newspaper, as you can imagine. A hyena researcher actually called in and said they've been denning in one of the main motorway exchanges in Johannesburg. They've been denning there for the last five years or whatever it was. Amazing what we don't realize goes on in our cities. Unfortunately though, no sign of our jackal here. Since Impala Plains seems to be devoid of mammal life, let's go across to James who has a large buffalo. Well, it's the same herd of buffalo everyone, but it's just coming across the border going into Biffle's Hook. So we had a question the other day, or the other day, <sighs> really lost my mind on leave. We had a question just now about why it's called Buff Biffle's Hook. Uh, well, there seem to be some biffles in it, and this is the property. They're heading north into Biffles Hook, and of course we don't go in there, but the animals are free to come and go as they please throughout the 8 million acres of the Greater Kruger National Park. And I'm just going to be quiet quickly. I don't know if you heard that. Brian is nodding vigorously, indicating that he could hear it through these 
earphones. So those are the ox pickers, everyone. We were chatting about ox pickers earlier. And that's a sound that you really want to listen out for if you're ever on foot in the bush here. It indicates the presence of herbivores that may be as harmless as an impala. But of course, it could mean buffalo or something even larger. Ooh, quickly, let's go across to Jamie. We've happened upon the most incredible scene here. <laughs> the crowned lapwings are attacking the Franklin. Look at them go. And the poor Franklin making sounds of distress. Oh. This poor hapless Franklin, I think, have just stumbled upon their nest site. <laughs> yes, run. <laughs> run. Shame. Feathers a bit ruffled along with their dignity. I don't think this particular family of Crested Franklin will make that mistake again. And speaking from experience, you definitely do not want to mess with a nesting pair of crowned lapwings, which is apparently what these poor Franklin did. Yeah, <laughs> help, 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 help. <laughs> Terror from the skies. attack by crowned lapwings. That's, that is a first for me. I have never seen crowned lapwings quite so determined to attack a group of completely harmless crested franklins. I really don't know what that was about. Let's go and have a look at the proud pair that are now savouring their success, looking decidedly smug and moving quite far away, unfortunately. Oh, I'm surprised. I didn't expect them to have nests or eggs at the moment. They can be quite savagely protective. There's actually a, a chick there. Oh, oh yes. There we go. Well done, Viam. Thank you. Well, that explains that little attack. It, just by in front of the pile of the elephant dung, running back towards the parent is a tiny, tiny little crowd lapwing chick and that explains that I think there's just one in the shadow dashing about unless there's a second one somewhere near the other parent <laughs> now having been savagely attacked by crowd lapwings before when I inadvertently strayed into their nesting site I sympathize with the Franklin it can be quite intimidating for somebody of my size I can only imagine what that must have been like for the poor Franklin. Now, a Franklin is unlikely to attack a lapwing chick. You never know, though. Every now and again, the strangest things happen out here in the bush, and it might have been that a Franklin took exception to a lapwing chick. The reason that we didn't see it straight away was, first of all, because we were distracted by all of the action, but also the alarm calls of a female or a male lapwing, both of them play a role in raising their chicks, will immediately cause the chick to lie down completely flat. It pops its head completely flat, it swings down, covering its white belly, and it just lies completely still like that. And the feathers are so perfectly, perfectly grass-colored and soil-colored that you would never, ever spot it, unless you were an exceptionally keen-eyed predator. And then you know you have to risk the wrath of the parents. That was fascinating. It's the first time I've ever seen a... a Quite such a determined attack on a city or a family of Franklin. Very interesting sighting. Just goes to show that an open plain that initially seems devoid of animal life can occasionally result in some very interesting sightings. And since we drew you away from the buffalo before James was quite finished, let's head back there. 
We're just moving into a better position as we welcome the second grade class at Rosemont School in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Uh, let me get this right. Mrs. Cahoon, Mrs. Gallup, Mrs. Murray, and Mr. Parker. Hello to you and to all the kids there in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Over there, we have some buffalo and they are wandering through. You can see the green leaves and they're just changing yellow. See how they're changing yellow? As you go into your summertime, so we've gone into winter. And all the leaves are turning yellow. And we're at the northeastern corner of what we call Juma. And Juma is a little piece of land, well, it's not that little, it's about 4,000 acres, a uh, piece of land in the western section of what is called the Kruger National Park. And the easiest way to describe that to you, everyone, is to say that it's a little bit like Yellowstone National Park. It's the same kind of thing, only it's about three times bigger than Yellowstone National Park. And this is not very similar to your American bison, but they're from the same family. And this is the African equivalent, if you like. And we're obviously very, very far away from you, where you are. We're a long way to the east and a long way to the south of where you are sitting in your classrooms there in Virginia Beach. And so it's much colder here than it is where you are right now. And also, it's a lot later in the day. You can see that the setting sun is just catching the ends of the trees there. There's ones glowing yellow. That's the last bits of the sun that are catching the tops of the trees. And you guys, of course, are only in the morning there. And that's one of the quirks of living here on planet Earth, of course, is that we don't all live at the same time. And they're all having, they've just had their drink. We saw them having their drink a little bit earlier. And now these buffalo are wandering through this, what we call woodland. And you can see it's called woodland. Well, you see why it's called woodland, because there are lots of trees here. And they're eating the grass below the trees. And sometimes Brian, who's on camera today, my name's James, by the way, Brian is on camera, and Brian said, oh, look at them, one of them's eating what we call a round-leaf teak. And very few animals will eat the round-leaf teak. And it's a special tree. There we go, well done, Brian. That's the tree there. And we as human beings can use that tree, believe it or not, to treat troubles with our eyes. So if you have troubles with your eyes and your eyes are sore, then you can pick those leaves and you can soak them in water, maybe boil them up a bit, wait for the water to cool down, and then you can use it to soothe any pain that you have in your eyes. You can drop the water into your eyes. So that's what we call a medicinal use, a traditional use of many of the plants out here. And many, many plants here have got some kind of traditional medicinal use because, of course, out here, for most of this area's history, there have been no doctors. There have only been to what we call traditional doctors, and sometimes they're a lot more effective than the doctors that you have to go and see when you've got a sniffle in your nose. Right, we're going to move a little bit forward. I'm a bit confused as to what's going on. Can you go again with that, Kirsten? Does that mean we should reintroduce them? Ah, the school is not with us, so I shall speak. I shall speak normally to you guys. <laughs> now, the school apparently had the wrong link. Um, I'm not sure what they were watching. Possibly the Graham Norton show instead. I'm not sure. Anyway, well, let's carry on. The buffalo have disappeared. I can't believe it. I remembered all those names of the teachers. I was so proud of myself. Didn't get any of them wrong. I'm going to have to do it again, and I guarantee you I'll make a mess of it. <laughs> I wonder what they were watching, Brian. Right, now the second grade class of Rosemont School with Mrs. Gallup, Mrs. Cahoon, Mrs. Murray and Mr. Parker are watching us. I got it, Brian. I got it right the second time around. And we, everybody, are watching some buffalo here. And I'm not going to tell you too much about them unless you have some questions because 
we have been watching them for a little while, but these guys are very much the same as your American bison. You know what a bison is. There we go. And we're in an area called the Kruger National Park. And the Kruger National Park is 8 million acres. That's much bigger than Yellowstone National Park, for example, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. These buffalo just grazing off into the woodland, eating grass, sometimes a few leaves. And then they'll huddle together because it'll be a cold night tonight as you go into your summertime. So we've hit winter and it'll be a chilly night tonight, probably dropping down to what we think is cold, maybe about 10 degrees Celsius. And 10 degrees Celsius in Fahrenheit is probably about 52 degrees or so Fahrenheit. And that for us is very cold, and these buffalo won't like that. You can see they don't have a very thick coat. They've got pretty thin hair. Some of them, the old boys like this chap in front of us, you can see his skin, so he doesn't have much hair at all. So they'll gather together, and they'll lie down in a big group, and that's how they'll stay warm during the winter time. There's no snow here. I don't think you get snow in Virginia Beach. I think there was snow at once, once, I think you told me, or someone from Virginia Beach told me. But there's no snow here, and I don't believe it's ever fallen in this area. So it never gets as cold as it does in the United States over here.